<sighs> so, navigation. Um, ironically, uh, the topic of navigation is actually about where are we right now and where are we going. So, um, you know, now that we've gotten to the right place, we can actually get started. Now, putting this all together, um, keeping in mind that we're helping you prepare for the um, for the exam, we need to cover off some dreaded theory. So, we're going to start off with the Earth. No, guys, it's not flat. Sorry, um, it's not a sphere either. It's actually an oblate spheroid. So. It's kind of like egg-shaped a little bit. It's, it's squished a little bit at the poles. It's a little bit wider at the equator. Um, so the true name of it is oblate spheroid. Now, whenever we want to kind of figure out where we are, if you look at any map, there's a grid on it. Right? There's, there's vertical lines for north-south. There's, there's uh, horizontal lines for east-west. And what we've done is drawn those on the surface of the Earth. So we have longitudes... Um, meridians of longitude and parallels of latitude. Now, the easy way to remember this is that the parallels uh, run parallel to each other and the meridians go from pole to pole. So hence, at the equator, they're wider apart than they are at the poles, so they converge and come together. Now, meridians of longitude, the way I always remember is that longitude, well, it's long. So the parallels of latitude as you get closer to the equator or get closer to the poles, they actually get shorter because you know they're circling the earth at a at a narrower diameter than the, the um than the uh the biggest diameter of the earth which is at the equator. But the longitudes are all the same length because they go from pole to pole. Now the prime meridian is uh, goes through Greenwich, England and it's it's basically zero degrees. So it's kind of the starting point. And then on the other side of the world is the international date line. And the significance of the international date line is that that is where the calendar day switches. So when you cross the international date line, um, we actually switch from one day to another. And uh, for anyone who's ever done any sailing in that area, um, there's a long-standing tradition with sailors every time you cross the international date line, you do this kind of ceremony thing. And the parallels of latitude, well, they start at the equator, and that's the longest one, and then they move uh, from there out to the, uh, the poles, and they're parallel, so they're the same distance apart. Now, it's kind of funny when you look at the history of how all of this kind of evolved as we, you know, through history figured things out, but um, the meridians of longitude at the equator, they're one nautical mile apart. That's actually where we get a nautical mile. And then the parallels of latitude are actually one nautical mile apart going uh, as we work our ways north and south. So these are some minor tidbits that you need to know for getting through the exam. Now, a lot of this has to do with time or is related to time. So uh, many years ago, as the human race began to travel faster and faster, um, in particular with trains. It's actually a Canadian invention. We invented something called standard time. Because basically, wherever you are in the world, all you do is you put a sundial out, and the sun kind of tells you what time it is. But you know, you move a few miles east or west, and, and you get a slightly different time. So time is actually divided around the world based on the meridians of longitude. And basically 360 degrees equals 24 hours. So if we go around, if the Earth, if the Earth spins once, because there's 360 degrees of longitude around the Earth, hence the 360 degree compass, um, that's 24 hours. So one hour is actually 15 degrees of longitude. One minute is 15 seconds of longitude and one second is, is sorry, it's, it's 15 minutes of longitude and one second is 15 uh, minutes of longitude. Um, so what basically happens is we, we, we have this correlating. Now, because we move a little bit on the Earth and use a sundial, we get this whole um, 
uh, you know, slightly different time. So hence we came up with um, standard time. And that's where Greenwich Mean Time, which is now called UCT or Universal Coordinated Time, um, sometimes referred to as Zulu Time, kind of all started. So we now have time zones where we divide the Earth up around the world um, and, you know, in our chunks, basically. So when we look at the Earth now and we say, you know, here's a, you know, Eastern time zone, Western time zone, et cetera. So this just correlates the two together. Now, from an aviation perspective, we use everything on UCT, which is Universal Coordinated Time. Um, so this is why the uh, weather reports, et cetera, are done on Universal Time. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, navigation is all about where I am and how can I get to where I want to go. And there's two concepts on this. The first is the Great Circle route. And the Great Circle is basically a circle on the surface of the Earth whose plane passes through the center. Now, we're always told in school that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But when we're traveling on the surface of the Earth, we're actually not traveling in a straight line. We're traveling in a curved line, and that curve is based on the surface of the Earth. So, if we want to do the shortest distance between two points over the surface of the Earth, what we need to do is do a great circle. And the great circle is a circle on the surface of the Earth whose plane passes through the center. So if you could picture the Earth as a big ball, think of it as like a, a rum ball or a timbit. And you're going to take a knife and you're going to cut it in half. Now when you, when you make that cut, you do it directly through the center. In case you do a nice flat cut, and the resulting edge of the now half, if that was the route that you're going to take around the surface, that would be the shortest distance between two points on the, on the surface of that sphere. Um, from a navigation perspective, this poses a bit of a challenge because it's a little bit hard to see in this graphic, but you end up starting to cross meridians and lines of, of, of latitude at different angles depending upon where you are in the, in the Earth's surface. We're also going to see how this becomes an issue when we take the sphere, which is the Earth, and we project it onto a flat surface, which is our map. Now, this is a bit of theory. Again, you need to know some of this terminology for the exam. For us as glider pilots, not really an issue because, you know, if we're doing 300 kilometers, woohoo, we're, we're a case of beer and celebrating. This really becomes an issue for the airliners who are flying, and you can see the example here um, that looks like about uh, the Caribbean or maybe Central America over to, um, I'm going to say about France somewhere, maybe Belgium. In that kind of a, of, a, of a route, you know, having the shortest distance, A, is going to be very important, but B, being able to navigate and maintain that shortest distance is also going to be very important. Now, a run line... Uh, is a line that cuts all the meridians at the same angle. So as we're planning our route, you know, to fly our gliders from Central America over to Belgium, uh, we want to use a great circle route because it's going to be shorter and faster than, than a rum line. And a rum line is what we would get if we started to follow our compass headings because we're going to now, you know, cut through all those meridians at the same angle. Uh, while we'll get there, it's not the quickest route. So you end up having multiple course changes throughout the course of your flight. And in today's world with GPSs and all kinds of electronic aids, this is not that big of an issue. But if you can think back to, you know, the golden age of aviation, the 30s, the 40s, you know, into the 50s, um, people were doing big long distance flights and they didn't have all those fancy aids. So you know, you look at the, the history records and you see these people flying these airplanes and they had a navigator with them because they need someone with that kind of skill to be able to kind of figure it out, right? So it was the exception that you had things like the uh, Lindbergh solo flight across the Atlantic and so forth. So, yeah, some interesting stuff here. So I'm just going to do a quick check. There we go. Good. No, no hands up at this point. 
Now, the other big challenge that we face is true north versus magnetic north. And this is where things like isogonic and agonic lines uh, appear on maps. So the reason for this is that true north, uh, which is the physical pole, okay, so I'm going to, uh, This one, there we go, 10, ha, ah. all right. True north is up here, it's at the top of the pole, okay? Magnetic north is offset from it, and depending upon where you are, you're going to have a difference, in this case, this example of 17 degrees, where your, your compass is gonna to point towards magnetic north, but the true north is gonna go over here. Now, all the maps are done for true north. Okay, so all the maps are done to true north with the note of what your magnetic variation is all about. Now, you'll notice if I line these two up and if I continue this line down, we get this line here, which is the point on the globe where magnetic north and true north line up with each other. So when we look at our map, we want to see where we are. Now, as we are here over here, there's, uh, I think that's Lake Erie, Lake Ontario. We're somewhere around 10 to 15 degrees off to the side. So if, I, if I'm over here in my glider here, and I look at magnetic north versus true north, I can see this, this kind of uh, what we call variation. And this concept basically is shown on a map using isogonic lines which connect points of equal magnetic variation. So when we read our map, we've plotted where we want to go, which is the true north. We then adjust what we, where we want to go based on magnetic. Now, if you were to fly across the United States from one coast to the other, you're going to go from about 20 degrees west variation to around 20 degrees, 25 degrees east variation, even though you are maintaining the same heading true. So again, you're going to have to be adjusting your course as you go. To further complicate things, the lines curve, because what we're looking at is a magnetic field. Now, if you remember your grade school math or your grade, grade, grade school science, you know, you do the iron filings and, and the filings would all line up in sort of this curving pattern around the pole of the magnet. So the further north you go, the closer the lines are together and the more they curve. So again, as we look down around the Great Lakes region, we see we've got about 10 degrees west variation. Now, what this is telling us is that the variation is based on your location. So as you move across the surface of the Earth, the magnetic variation compared to the true uh, is changing. Oh, Dan Lodge has a question. Let me just unmute. Dan, talk to me. Hello, Dan. I have no Dan. Okay, so I'm just going to, Dan, I'm going to lower your hand and, and mute you again. Oh. Dan, you there? Nope. Okay. So, um, as you get closer to the North Pole, the magnetic north, um, the lines are getting more closer together and they're, they're getting more curved. So, as we navigate around the Earth, we want to make sure that we're aware of what our compass is doing in relation to what the map is and where we want to go. Now, magnetic variation is noted on your maps with these isogonic lines. And what we do is we would plot where we want to go on our map, and then we would look for the isogonic lines, and we would adjust the compass heading appropriate to the isogonic line as noted on the map. And the way to do this is when you have a westerly variation, you add it to true. So if I calculated my path, and let's say I'm saying my, my course is, is, you know, two, three, five degrees um, true, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the, the variation. In this case, it's 10 degrees 
So this is a, um, a BNC, and I zoomed in on the area, not of Wasaga Bay, just north of Great Lakes, because there's it had a nice clear um, instance of an isogonic line there. So if I'm at 2, 3, 5 degrees true, plotted on the map, then I need to add 10 degrees. So I would go 2, 4, 5 degrees on my compass. And the easy way to remember this is west is best, east is least. So when you have west variation noted on your map, as I've circled here, then you add it. If you have east variation, then you subtract it. And of course, if you have zero, then zero. Now, if you want to calculate your magnetic heading to the true heading, you do the exact opposite. Okay, so west you would subtract and east you would add. So if you're sitting in your glider on the end of the runway and you're looking at your compass and it's saying, you know, 150 degrees and you're on Great Lakes, you need to subtract about 10 degrees and you're going to see that you're actually the true heading that you're pointing instead of 150 degrees is going to be 140 degrees. So why do we go to all this trouble? Well, because we use magnetic compasses for navigation, okay? And for, for a lot of years, that was our primary method of orienting ourselves. And uh, when you got out onto the open ocean, uh, when you're out on the open plains with, you know, no landmarks around, places like that, the only way to know which way is which is to use your compass. Now, if you have a sextant and you know how to use it, you can also figure out where you are by looking at the stars, which direction is north, south, and so forth. The compasses were a much easier method to read than a sextant. Also, the nice thing with a compass is you, you, you can continue to fly the plane uh, or navigate the ship um, while using it as opposed to, you know, the sextant makes it a little bit harder. So let's talk a little bit about magnetic deviation. Now, on a map, you're going to have magnetic variation, okay, and it'll be listed. Oh, and sorry, one other quick thing on magnetic variation. It changes. So over time, the magnetic uh, field of the Earth is actually moving. So you look at an older chart, and that line of 10 degrees west may read 9 degrees west or 8 degrees west as you, you know, look at the older charts. And we actually saw this uh, recently within the last few years where our um, runway headings changed from 0927 to uh, 0826. So we actually had a, um, a change in the, the compass headings of the, uh, of the um, runways because all runways are done in, in magnetic headings. Now, that's variation. Deviation is the errors of the compass instrument itself, and they're usually caused by the aircraft or the, the craft that they're in. So this is really much more prevalent in a power plane. So think about this. You're sitting in your power plane. There's a nice little picture of a, a Piper Cub down there. You're sitting in your power plane. You've got a compass mounted on the dash right in front of you. Just a few inches beyond where your compass is mounted is a nice big heavy chunk of metal that makes lots of noise, uh, your engine. Now, most engines, they're mostly made of aluminum, not a huge amounts of ferrous metal in there. And when I say ferrous metals, those are the iron-based metals that, that attract a compass. However, when that engine is running, there's a magnetic field because you have electrics. Now, the electrics uh, would be things like your radio, your lights, uh, any other electric instruments you have, such as your GPS. But the electrics are also just the spark. So when you've got your engine running and you've got the, um, you know, the magnetos on and it's, it's creating the spark to run the engine, you know, that is going to create an electromagnetic field and that field will affect a compass. So depending upon the installation and the direction you're pointing, if you do things like simply start the engine or turn on the radio, you're going to see the compass actually change its reading. Now, every time you have a compass card, 
Um, every time you have a compass card, <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, every time you have a compass, you have to have a compass card. So you need to compensate that. And basically, the way you do this is you swing the compass. And what that means is you take the airplane, you start the engine, you fire up the electronics, you turn on the radio, you know, whatever that looks like, and you point the airplane at magnetic north. And you know that it's magnetic north because You've, you've checked that ahead of time and you have that setting on the ground. So a lot of airports have a compass rose painted on the pavement. And what you do is you, you park the airplane pointed, you know, magnetic north, magnetic east, magnetic south, and so on around, um, around the compass. Uh, and then you read what the compass says. And let's say you're pointing at magnetic north and your compass is reading magnetic north. It's a little bit hard to see in this, but right here it says four north steer, and what we would do is we would put in a north. Then we would turn the airplane and point it at 30 degrees, and we would read what the compass says. And let's say it's reading 25. So 430 steer, and we would write a 25 in here, and so on. Okay, so what you would basically do is you're, is you're putting a reference card into the airplane to say, for this heading, steer this course. For this heading, steer this course. Now, some of the fancier compasses do have little magnets that you can put around them to help, um, to help compensate for that so that what they actually read is more accurate to what... Um, is actually showing on the compass itself. If you have a compass installed in your airplane, you have to have a compass card. Now, I'm using the example of a power-driven airplane because it has typically more electrics than a glider. It has an engine which creates an electromagnetic field. When you swing compasses in gliders, especially if you have no electrics, you often get, you know, 430, steer 30, 460, steer 60, and so on. Um, because you really don't have a lot of electrical or magnetic interference with the compass. But you still have to have the card. Okay. Now, there's different types of compasses. One of the most common is magnetic. Big advantage with magnetic compass is A, they're inexpensive. They're, um, I want to say they're very reliable, but they are prone to errors. And when I say they're reliable, I mean they work. They don't run out of battery. They don't die on you. They keep working. So even when your aircraft is parked and shut down, your magnetic compass is still working. It is prone to a number of errors, such as northern turning error, acceleration error, magnetic dip. And we're going to talk about those. The second type of compass is called a gyro compass or a gyro heading setter. Now, the way this works is it's actually an instrument that has a gyroscope inside of it. So when you first start up your airplane, whether it's electrically driven or vacuum driven, most of them are, are tend to be vacuum driven, um, it spins up this gyro and then you adjust a knob on the face of it and you dial in the current heading. And as you fly along and turn left and right, the gyroscope will keep this pointed you know, in the correct direction. But over time, they do tend to drift. So without changing course, you're flying along at, let's say, heading 270. You're maintaining that heading. Your gyro compass is set at 270. After about five or ten minutes or so, it'll start to drift to one side or the other. So what you have to do is, um, you know, make that adjustment. Now, we kind of fast forward a little bit in time. As Roger's commenting, some aircraft have directional gyros that are automatically slaved to the compass, um, which basically means it's going to go and check and fix the drift itself. So if you get into a slightly older model, you know, every 10 minutes or so, you need to look at your magnetic compass and, and sort of make that adjustment. Um, one of the big advantages with a gyro compass is it doesn't swing around the way a magnetic compass does, and we're going to talk about a couple of those errors in a moment. Now, the last one is the GPS. And I put a note on here that says it only works when moving. GPSs are great at telling you where you are. So you turn on a GPS, once it's acquired the satellite, uh, it'll tell you within a very 
minute distance of where you are within 10, 20, 30 feet kind of thing. However, as a direction indicator, it can't tell you which way you're facing until you start to move. So what the GPS is doing is it's using the movement to calculate. That's why in your car GPS, you know, when you first turn on, you're not moving, it's sort of pointing the wrong way. And then as soon as you start to roll, it spins around and orients itself. So the advantages with the GPS is it's extremely accurate. It's not prone to some of the errors that the magnetic or gyro compass is. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is if you have an electrical issue and it shuts down, um, or you have difficulty acquiring the satellites because of um, heavy cloud or, or you're not have a clear view of the sky, which for us in aviation is much less of an issue. So I know when I go hiking and stuff and I carry my GPS with me, uh, you get down into the woods and sometimes it loses its signal. So those are the, the kind of different types of compass. Now, for us in modern day flying, GPS is rural. Uh, more and more we're seeing them, they're cheaper. Uh, especially in gliding, if you have a Android or iPhone, um, just you know, fire up the app um, XC Soar, and away you go. You got a very good, very accurate instrument. However, they are prone to failure, and we do need to have that backup. So you're going to see, you know, magnetic compasses still installed. Rarely do you see a gyro compass in a glider. I don't think I've ever seen one. Okay. Now, some of the errors that we see. The first one is northern turning error. And there's a quick and easy way to remember this. When you turn north, the compass lags. When you turn south, the compass leads. Where do you all want to go to vacation? You want to go south, right? Everyone always talks about going south for the winter, right? So hence, when you turn south, you go there faster because that's where people want to go. When you're turning north, eh, it takes a little bit longer. And basically what's happening here and there's a bunch of fancy physics behind this, which we're not going to get into because you don't need to. You turn towards the north, your compass is going to temporarily read slower of the turn. So in this example here, when I'm changing direction by 90 degrees, the compass isn't quite going to read 90 degrees yet. So if we're heading due east, and then we do a turn to the north, 90 degree course change, level the wings, it's going to take the compass a few extra moments to get there. When we turn to the south, the compass is actually going to rotate past south initially for just a moment and then come back in line. Okay. Acceleration error. When you're heading east or west in the northern hemisphere and you accelerate or decelerate, what's going to happen is the momentary change of where north is combined with the acceleration will cause the compass card to tilt ever so slightly, which causes it to point in the wrong direction and actually rotate. So what does all this tell me? Well, I need to be at a constant airspeed. I need to not be turning. And when we get close to the magnetic north or south pole, you get into magnetic dip. So if you actually were to fly over the magnetic pole or very close to it, the compass card will actually tilt. And if you can picture a compass for a moment, um, there it is in the first image, it's sitting flat, and then it rotates and tilts. Now, as you get close to the, the poles, it'll actually tilt because the magnetic forces are now starting to go vertical, and it's pulling down to the, um, to the pole. Okay? So as we get very close to the poles, we're going to have an inaccurate reading. So what's going to happen is, I'm going to just give you a moment to read this. I'll be right back. Just give me a half a second here.
Okay, sorry about that. I just had to step out for just a half a second. Um, so what this tells me is magnetic compass is only accurate when the aircraft is flying wings level in a steady state, non-accelerated. Okay. Now, if we want to do a turn, and this is where there's a concept in power flying called a standard rate turn. And in the standard rate turn, we use a turn coordinator. We establish a specific bank angle. And we maintain that. It takes two minutes to do a 360. So about three degrees per second. So by dividing this, we can plan our turn. So if we want to change course, for example, 90 degrees, I'll take three divided by 90, figure out the number of seconds. And you roll your aircraft into a standard rate turn. You count the number of seconds. You roll back into level. Then you let the compass settle down and check to see if you're on the right heading. Wow, this is all sounding very complicated and complex. Well, kind of is. Think about our standard. Whoops, I gotta remove my uh, remove my lines before I do that. There we go. Think about the standard flight mode of a glider. So, if magnetic compasses really are of not much use when in a turn, they're really not of much use to a glider pilot. Well, in our normal state, which is thermaling, circling. So this is why many of you will go through your training, get your license, and even fly for maybe a year or two before you ever really use a compass. Because we spend so much time flying and circling. So if we're doing these local flights around the field, or we're staying pretty close to final glide, we're keeping visual reference to where the field is, and then we're circling most of the time, the compass really is kind of not of much use. It's not until we get into doing cross-country flying where we're actually spending a fair amount of time on straight and level that it becomes a real issue. And this is part of the reason why GPSs are so, so popular when it comes to gliding. Okay. So what can we do about this? Well, first thing, we need to be aware of how the system works. And we need to know that if we're going to be using a compass for our navigation, we need to fly straight and level, let it settle down, and then we can check to see what heading we're on. Although a compass is of no use to us when we're thermaling, once we go wings level and head out on whichever direction we're going to go, then the compass can become very useful because it'll help us make sure that we're heading in the right direction. So if we get disoriented, we're trying to figure out which way is north, you know, away we go. But this is why we are so adamant from an instructional perspective that you gain that awareness of where you are and maintain that awareness of where you are. Because as you're circling, um, not only is it disorienting, for you, but it's extremely disorienting for the poor compass. Okay. So with that in mind, we're going to use maps and charts, and we're going to take a look at this whole concept of, you know, where am I on the surface of the Earth, and let's figure out how we can navigate. And there's a couple of different types of charts. So the first one we're going to talk about briefly is a VTA or a VFR terminal area chart, and it's on a scale of 25,000 or sorry, 250,000 to 1. And it uses a traverse Mercator projection. And the way a traverse Mercator projection works is, is as if we put a huge cylinder of paper around the Earth and we projected the surface of the Earth onto that piece of paper. And this method works okay for small areas. The other option we have is for a um, VNC chart, which is the, the visual navigation chart, which uses a scale of one to 500,000. And here we use a Lambert conformal conical projection. Now, you don't have to know the names of the types of projections. The reason that we're mentioning this is that each type of projection introduces some error. And depending upon whether I want a larger picture or a smaller picture. Now, if you've ever looked at a world map, oh, sorry, this is the um, different charts, the, the different VNCs that you can order for Canada. 
Okay, so you can actually get the entire country plotted out in these various charts. And you can see the Toronto down the bottom there. Um, there's Winnipeg off to the left a little bit in the center. So we would we would pick the chart that's appropriate to where we're going, what we're doing, that sort of thing. So if we're going to fly from Toronto to to uh, uh, Winnipeg, um, we'd need the Toronto chart, we'd need the Sioux chart, the Thunder Bay chart, as well as the Winnipeg chart. Okay. So I want to just take a moment and, and consider a map of the entire world. Now, using those first two projection methods, um, we get relatively accurate charts, but again, they're relatively accurate only for a small area. The only way to have a truly accurate chart for the entire world is to do it as a globe. Because when I have a globe, I'm actually duplicating the shape of the Earth, so hence I'm able to project onto that curved, um, you know, oblate spheroid surface. Now, what happens in a, um, uh, a world map is the, the poles get um, exaggerated. So Greenland kind of looks bigger than it actually is because it would, it would kind of, you know, be projected out. Um, New Zealand and Australia, actually, they're much further apart than they appear. It's kind of more like uh, the distance from Toronto to Vancouver. Um, they appear to be pushed together and, and so forth. So we get some distortions. And we can simulate this by simply looking at the same picture from an angle. Now, when I look at it straight on, uh, Russia on this map, the big yellow, that's huge. I look at it on the angle, and Russia looks much smaller, and Canada looks much bigger. In fact, Canada is now much bigger than the States, and well, South America looks tiny. So this is effectively what's happening when I go back to and think about these different projections, you know, this works for, you know, kind of this, this portion right here where the map's touching the sphere. And then the further out I go to the sides here, in this direction or in this direction, the more distorted the image becomes. So this is why we have a scale of, of only 250,000. Because at that scale, as I move further away from where the, the projection is actually touching the surface of the Earth, the more distortion we get. Same thing with the conical uh, projection. And hence, that's why we have a number of different maps. And you'll notice that each map has sort of an arc to it. Um, although when it's printed, it's going to be appearing to be rectangular. Again, we're getting that distortion. So. Simulating this, we look at the, the world map from the, the front on, we look at it from the side, and basically what's happening is all charts, any flat paper map that you have, will have a certain amount of distortion. The smaller the size or area that that map covers, the less distortion you're going to have. So if you just have a map that has, you know, your house and your block and your neighbors, it's going to be very, very accurate. The further afield you go, the less accurate it becomes. Okay, so that's the basic theory of how charts are created. Now, uh, we were chatting at the beginning just before starting. Svetman was, was uh, commenting on he has difficulty reading maps. Honestly, I do too. There's a lot of information there. Uh, there's actually even a lot more information that we can get through the Canadian Flight Supplement. Now, the Canada Flight Supplement is a way of giving us additional detail that we need for each airport. So if I just back up here for a second, um, here's a picture of a, a DNC. And if you take a look closely, um, we can see there's an airport right here. I think that's another one there. You know, we don't nearly have enough scale to like zoom right in. There's an airport here. Let's move the paper away. Uh, we can't zoom right in. So what the, the Canada Flight Sup does, the flight supplement, is it zooms right in for us. Now, both the charts and the flight supplements, they have a lifespan. So they're issued, um, they go for a couple years, and then they're retired, basically. And on the cover, it says, you know, this is good from this date to this date. 
Same thing with the DNCs. It tells you the date of issue. And you need to buy replacement ones every year. The reason for this is a couple. First of all, we mentioned how the uh, magnetic field changes over time. And second of all, um, other things change. Airports open, airports close, uh, control zones get modified, all that kind of stuff. So they're constantly reissuing these, updating them to keep them relevant. Now, the Canada Flight SUP is very similar to that. But what it does is it is a map as well, but it zooms in. So here is our runway at Great Lakes. And in fact, it's zoomed into the point where we can see um, the buildings. Okay, so this little building right here, that's Mike's house. There's the barn. There's the hangar. Okay. Here's the neighbor's house, the neighbor's barn, uh, the houses up the street, and so on. So when you're planning a flight to Great Lakes and you pull out the Canadian Flight Supplement, you're getting a pretty clear picture of what the runway is. We can see it's, it's 2,033 feet long. We can see the magnetic heading is 0826. Um, it also, you notice this triangle right here. That triangle represents the windsock. Now, the image that I have is slightly old because, as we know, the windsock is now moved to the other side of the taxiway. So every year, Mike gets a notification from Transport Canada, says, is there any changes? He is actually required by Transport Canada to update. So if he put in a second taxiway or if we installed another runway or uh, we move the windsock, right, we need to update that drawing. Other information it gives us the GPS or the coordinates of the field, the field elevation. Okay, so when we're planning that cross-country flight from one field to another, so if I took off from, let's say, um, uh, York Soaring to fly towards Tottenham to fly to over to Great Lakes to pick up the traveling trophy, well, I can look at the Canada Flight Stop and I know that. York Soaring is 1550 above sea level, 1550 feet. Then I can check and see that Great Lakes is only 823 above sea level. So I can get these kind of detailed bits of information. Another really, really useful piece of information is the operator of the field. So here we see Mike and Cheryl's name, and we see their phone number. So we're thinking about doing a cross-country trip. We're going to go visit another airfield. We pull out our flights up, we find out where they're located, we get a picture of the field, its length, its orientation, its elevation, and we can also phone the owners and say, hey, what's going on? Um, if you're going to get uh, flight planning information, London weather briefing, now this is, there's the phone number for the weather briefing, but most of the time people are using the internet nowadays. Um, any services, and there's codes for this, you'd have to look it up in the in the um, uh, the index. Here's the runway data. So we see the runway is actually 083 degrees and 263 degrees, so the exact headings. And also very important, it's turf with limited winter maintenance. So not a good field to go fly in in the wintertime. Okay. Um, other good information here, the frequency, 123.2, and some additional information such as right and left-hand circuits for the runway. Powered aircraft use opposite pattern to the gliders. So if I show up, I fly over the field, I look down, I see a glider in the circuit, I see a power plane in the circuit, I know what to expect. And probably one of the most important pieces is the cautions. And you'll see this on every airfield that's a glider club, extensive glider activity. So it's letting people know that if you're going to come visit this field, expect to see a bunch of gliders flying around. Okay. Um, other good information, and y'all know this from being on the field, but you know when Neil decides to do his cross country and fly to Great Lakes, uh, we'll give you a trophy by the way, Neil, if you do that. <laughs> 
There's a ditch at the west end of runway 26 between the threshold and the road. So we can see in the map, here's the road. There's the threshold of eight right there. And that, you know, that little one sentence there tells me a lot because it's like I'm picturing the road now. There's a road, there's a ditch, there's the end of the runway. So as I come in, um, you know, over 08, I want to carry a little extra height for the road for sure, also for that ditch. And, you know, that's telling me that I've got a bit of a displaced front, displaced threshold there. Okay. So there's lots of good information that you can get from the Canadian Flight Supplement. And if you're planning to do cross country, highly recommend that, you know, the airport that you plan to land at, go find a copy of the Flight Sup. If you don't have one, buy one or ask around at the field. There's a few extra copies kicking around. Crack it open and have a look. And in fact, just out of interest, you know, crack it open and have a look. Look up a couple of different fields. You can find Pearson in there. Um, you know, you'll find all the big airports. You'll find all the smaller airports. Anything that's a registered airport, it's a, it's a pretty thick book. Okay. Oh yeah, I forgot I have the zoomed in version. <laughs> so you zoom in and you can you can really see what's going on. I mean, we can see there's these tree icons to tell us there's a, a bit of bush right there. Um, again, the windsock. There we can see you know the end of the runway right at the road, and so forth. So you can really get a very clear picture of what this runway, uh, what this airport looks like, and what services are available when you when you arrive. Okay. Now. This, um, yeah, you know what, let's do our break here. It's 8 o'clock right on the nose. We're just going to get into some chart information and chart reading. So um, I think we're at a good spot for our, our break. I'm just going to unmute everyone. Dan, Dave, Karen, Neil, welcome back. Hello. Hello. Um, is there any questions, thoughts, comments as we uh, progress here? You mentioned XC Store is available for the iPhone, but I can't find it. I had it on my Android, but no luck finding anything for the Android. I thought it was Android and iPhone. I know it's definitely Android, but maybe it's only yeah, Android. I had it on my Android, but yeah. no luck with the iPhone. No? Okay. So I'm going to update that and say it's only available on Android, because I have it on an Android device. Um, and, you know, you can pick up a pretty inexpensive Android device, uh, like a used one. I actually, um, and you don't need, by the way, you do not need to have a plan. So I have an old phone from work. It's a, a, a Galaxy S2 or something. Um, it doesn't work as a phone anymore because there's no plan and I don't have a SIM card in it. Um, but XC Store still works. It connects to the GPSs and it totally works. And if it's on, you can get it for free. That's good. Okay. Yeah, so the download for um, XC Store is for free, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I know you can find a, uh, um, a decent uh, used tablet for Someone's making a bit of noise there. Yeah, and the other thing a lot of people are starting to do is they're starting to use XCSOR on, um, on, co on uh, those readers, on the phone, on the readers. Kobe's or whatever? Kobo. Kobo, that's the one. Thank you. Is that Kindle that it works on? Does it work on Kindle as well? I think it does. Talk to Tom because I'm pretty sure he was running it on a Kindle. And one of the advantages with that that a lot of people are finding is in bright light, the black and white screens are tend to be better read than the color screens. But yeah, you can pick up an Android device pretty cheap. Okay. okay, so if there's no other questions, I'm going to mute. We'll put up our timer. We'll do our 10-minute break. Nope, 24 minutes. Sorry, I'm using it for work today. Uh, All right. We'll see you guys back here in 10 minutes. Cheers.
a few seconds left. All right, let's just close that down. Can I unmute everyone again? Hey, Arthur. Dan, are you still there? Karen, Dave, Neil. Hello. Hello. Okay, I've got everyone unmuted. Any questions, thoughts, or comments before we continue on? Just a, just might be a helpful comment. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, when when I first learned about the projections, um, the, the sort of illustrations we got was like a Mercator with a globe, and then a light bulb in the middle. Yeah. And so you could visualize the that's it, the beams of light coming from the middle of the Earth through the surface, projecting onto the uh, inside of the cylinder. And that would give you a much better, you know, a good idea of why you got so much distortion yeah. and how it kind of came together. So that's just a sort of comment I thought that I'd yeah. sort of mention. And it's, yeah, it's kind of interesting because... If, if we do a cylinder like this, the, the sphere of the Earth is actually only going to touch on this one little thin line here. That's right. Right? Yeah. So that, as that, That's the only accurate part of it. That's the only true... Absolutely. And, and that's why we have the smaller scale. Um, yeah. As where this one, and you notice that if you look carefully, you can actually see how the surface of the globe is actually bulging above the cone a little bit. You get and a sort helped. of pin, pin, pin cushion type thing. Yeah, that, that helped kind of remove some of the distortion because now it's actually touching here and touching here, right? Yeah. So it, it, yeah, it's, it's not even touching the edges, yeah. Yeah, so it's just, it, it's helping, you know, to sort of minimize the amount of distortion. But the reality is the only true, the, the truest representation of our Earth's surface is actually a globe. Anytime you try to turn that into a flat surface, um, you are going to have distortion. Well, we ought to just carry globes around in the airplane. I think so. I was just going to say, globes are too big to carry. Maps are not accurate. GPS it is. <laughs> it's a, it's a <laughs> uh, yeah, it has its own set of issues. All right. Are we good to move on? Okay. Again, uh, I'm going to mute everyone. If you have a question or a comment or anything, just please raise your hand. So we're going to now take a look at some basic chart information. And normally, if we were in the classroom, we'd be actually pulling charts out. And we'd be asking you to find the scale and so forth. Um, what I want to do is just kind of make you aware of some of these elements here. And then we're going to walk through how we would actually plot a course on a chart and talk a little bit about how to, how to do that navigation. So one of the first things is actually to find the scale. Now, um, VNCs and terminal area charts, they have a, a specific scale, which is, you know, the 1 to 500,000, et cetera. Um, you know, you need to find that, and you'll find a reference on the chart where here's a little printed piece that shows, you know, what one kilometer, two kilometers, or miles are. And for those of you who attend the aviation safety seminars at Transport Canada, which are good to go to, you may remember that they have um, free rulers, and these are kind of a light blue in color, which is the protective stuff you peel it off, and you got a see-through clear ruler, and what it has on it is it has the scale for a VNC um, on it, as well as a, uh, oh, it's just the VNC, I'm just looking at one now, and what you can do now is, because it's clear, you can lay it on your chart, you can see your chart was still having a straight line, and it gives you the scale. So, you know, next time you're at Transport Canada seminar, pick one of those up. Um, the next thing is the long and latitude, longitude and latitude. There's a grid on the chart that gives you your longitude and latitude. So when you're looking at the chart, you'll find those, those lines. And when you're plotting these manually, uh, you would use a compass, a Douglas protractor, um, and, you know, draw your lines, find where you've got a longitude, latitude line. You can orient the compass to that and then um, figure out what your heading is. The relief, which is the, um, 
the terrain basically. So there's colors to show, you know, where there's hills and things like that. Isogonic lines, which we've already touched on briefly, and the isogonic lines are the lines of the same magnetic variation, which we saw with the 10 degrees west. So having plotted our lines, we would then locate where the nearest isogonic line is and apply that deviation to our, our planning. Also represented on the charts are things like communities, roads, railways, and these can be very useful in visual navigation because you're looking down at the ground, um, you're seeing roads flow along, you're seeing railway lines, etc. Um, for anyone who has flown, especially uh, out Toronto Soaring Way or uh, uh, York Soaring, Highway 9 is very distinctive from the air. The roads coming from the south and the roads going to the north leave at different angles. So you see the roads coming in from the south on a bit of an angle. They're not quite 90 degrees to Highway 9, and then the roads going north are 90 degrees. So you're flying along. You're trying to figure out where the heck you are. You look down. You see this road where the cross streets aren't all straight, and that can give you an, a, you know, an indication. You then look on your chart and find a similar road feature, and you've now oriented yourself and located yourself on the map. Uh, aerodromes, of course, are, lo are listed. And you will see a reference to the aerodrome. It'll tell you what the name is. You look it up in your Canadian Flight Supplement, and you get all of the details. As well, restricted areas. And these are very important because, you know, you don't want to fly into those. Uh, just north of us is Base Borden. Um, it's, a, it's a Canadian Forces base. And, yes, they do have an active live fire shooting range for artillery practice. So, mm, yeah, not an area I want to be landing out in. Um, and then finally, there is a compass rose to show you what the orientation of, uh, you know, north versus uh, magnetic versus true. And you'll actually see there's a couple of, um, of um, there's usually a couple of those on the chart uh, for different areas, depending upon the, the size and scale of the chart. Now, um, Roger's asking, are any maps legally available in electronic form? And short answer, Roger, yes, they are. Now, um, I'm going to have to step back a little on uh, this piece because I'm not hugely familiar with it, but there are some forms of maps uh, available legally. Now, from a legal perspective, um, you do need to have a primary navigation system that is independent of your aircraft's electrical system. So what this means is you need to be able to shut off your electrical system without losing your navigation system. So, and I think the laws on this have recently changed, and, and I apologize, much like Dan, I've been very busy at work as well. I did want to do some research on this before our session tonight, and I just didn't get time to. But um, it used to be that you had to carry a paper map and then you could use whatever navigation system you wanted, such as GPSs, phones, divining rods, whatever, as long as you also had the paper map as a backup. Okay. Now, technically, what was happening is the paper map was your primary system, and you're using a secondary method. Um, with the you know continuing reliability of tech of technology, those are becoming more and more. Um, ubiquitous, they're becoming more and more used, uh, products are increasing, and I remember having a chat with a, a gentleman who had done a home build, and he told me that um, since the iPads have their own electrical system, um, and this was his opinion, so um, he said, you know, I can shut off my airplane's electricals, electrical system, the iPad will keep running on its own internal battery, um, so he, he reckoned that qualified him to make him legal to run that as a, as a primary navigation system. Um, again, I want to look into that from a, from a, um, from a uh, you know, I want to just double check on that before we kind of, you know, make a true call on that. But the reality is you can have, you can use an electronic navigation system. Just tuck a map into your map pocket or under your seat, have it available. It's actually a really good idea to have because I've never had the batteries run out on a map. 
<laughs> you know, I've never had the screen go blank and, and that kind of thing, right? So I'm, I'm going to be one of those pilots who's going to finish my flying days with a paper map as well as any electronic versions, um, you know, carry that around. So I, I hope that answers that question. Um, on a side note to that, uh, when we talked in terms of cross country, if when you do your bronze badge, your 50 kilometers, sorry, silver badge, 50 kilometers, you have to do it with compass and paper. You cannot use a GPS. You cannot have someone um, um, shepherd you or lead you. So the idea behind this is that although the um, you know, GPS navigation is becoming more and more common and more and more sophisticated, we still want to make sure that you have the ability to navigate without those aids. Because, you know, one day you'll be out flying around and you run out of battery or your GPS dies or locks up or, or something happens and you need to find your way home, right? So that's why we're, uh, that's why that, that exists. So we're going to start with some map preparation. Now, we've already seen how this map for Toronto, for the Toronto VNC, covers quite a huge distance and area. So one of the first things you would do is you would fold the map so that it's in, within the area that you want. Okay, And having done that with this map, um, Ronan is, is uh, Great Lakes is down in this area here somewhere. I'm just trying to locate it. So what you would do is in preparing your chart, the first thing you want to do is draw 10 kilometer concentric circles around your home field. And by that, what we mean is we're going to draw a circle around our home field 10 kilometers away. We're going to draw one 20 kilometers away, 30 kilometers away, and so on. Um, so you draw these on the map. Now, the purpose for doing this is to help you with final glide. Um, fortunately, with you know XC SOAR and other modern you know electronic aids, you put in your glider's performance. You tell it where you want to go, and it tells you if you got what you need to get there. But again, if the, if this shuts down, this will help you identify how far away can you be and still make it home. Um, what altitudes do you need if I'm at you know certain locations? And then with the 10 kilometer circles, you would figure out how much altitude do you need to go 10 kilometers in your glider. Right? So if I've got a you know, 20 to 1 glide ratio, well, I'm going to need uh, to go 10 kilometers. I'm going to need, what is that, 200 meters of height? I think that's right. No, because it's 1 to 20, so 1 foot down, 20 forward. So to go 10 kilometers, I'm going to need half a kilometer of height, so 500 meters. Okay, So we calculate that out, and we figure out you know, what our glide ratio is. Now, the second thing that we're going to do is we're going to draw easily distinguished landmarks. So here I've drawn some, some yellow circles around some of the different landmarks. It could be a tower, it could be a town, it could be an airfield, um, you know, whatever that looks like. So you can see this upper one here is Shelburne. So there's Shelburne right here as a town that's easily distinguished. Okay, uh, here's Toronto Soaring and so on. And actually, while we're, while we're here, by the way, here's Highway 9. So there's the roads coming into 9 from the south on that angle that I was talking about. Okay. And then here are the roads leaving from the north. So actually, do I have that on? There we go. Let's use this one. There's the roads leaving from the north, nice and straight and square to Highway 9. And here's the roads coming in from the south on this angle. Um, as you can see, they come in on the angle. Right, so that can be a really good way to help kind of orient yourself as to where you are. Okay, so we draw our circles. We would then fold the map appropriately to what we're planning to do here. We draw our easily distinguishable landmarks on the ground, and then we draw our track line. Now, in this particular example, I'm going to go from um, Great Lakes gliding up to Toronto soaring. Okay, so we're going to do that nice little little trek up there and go visit 
And you notice that when I drew this line, it went right over top of one of my easily distinguishable landmarks. So there's a, you know, there's an airfield there. Um, gives me a nice landmark. I can see that. I can fly towards it. In fact, I can fly right over it. As I'm flying towards Toronto Soaring, off to my right should be Shelburne, so I can look for the town, and so on. And again, I would mark different areas, different different settings, uh, sorry, different different uh, landmarks appropriately. Now, um, in the original version of our navigation ground school that we used to teach, uh, we used to recommend, you know, draw your lines and then laminate your chart. And by laminating it, then you can use a grease pencil and you can draw multiple tracks and erase them and so forth. Um, it really depends upon how much cross-country flying you're going to do and how much you're going to use the chart in that way. Um, this is kind of a very much a, a power pilot method uh, to do that. It also kind of saves your chart a little bit so that it'll last a little bit better, but I mean, you do have to replace them. So we draw our track line. So we're going to go from Great Lakes to to Toronto Soaring. We're then going to draw drift lines 10 degrees either side of our path. So we would take our Douglas Protractor and we would mark the 10 degree angles there and, and draw them. Then we're going to draw the same thing in the opposite direction. So we're going to draw 10 degree drift lines leaving Great Lakes and 10 degree drift lines coming into Toronto Soaring. Now the reason behind this is that as we're going to be flying this track and navigating and looking out, this is likely where we're going to be is within these drift lines. So if we if we don't compensate for wind properly, uh, maybe if we're reading our compass a little bit wrong, that kind of thing, this will help us focus where we're going to look um, should we get a little bit lost or out of direction and, and help us, you know, get back into the right place and, and head in the right direction. Okay. So we mark our track at 10 degree, at 10 kilometer intervals. Now we've already done that because we drew our circles. Okay. So having done that, I can actually just use the circles I've already drawn. Now, if I was going between, let's say, Toronto Soaring and London, then I would want to mark my track at those 10 kilometer intervals. Measure the true heading. In this case, it's 269 degrees true. Now, I would do this by looking at the grid on my chart. And, you know, there's a lot of lines on here, so it's hard to see. But you'll notice this line here, and there's a 90-degree cross to it. That is your longitude and latitude lines. So I would locate those, and if I was doing this on my chart, I would be using this one here and this one here because they're the closest ones to my, my track line. So I would locate that. I would use that to orient my compass. I would then read what the settings is, and we see that it's 269 degrees true. Now, we've already determined that our compass reads different, so we need to locate the closest isogonic line, and we would add or subtract that. Now, it's kind of a little bit off the edge at the top here, but you can just see the 10 degrees west showing at the top. We follow that dotted line down. Okay, so I'm following the dotted line down here, right? I follow this dotted line down, and look at that. It crosses right over our path. So 10 degrees west would be a really good one to use. So I'm going to do that, and as we've already identified, uh, west is best. Sorry, there we go. West is best, so I'm going to take my 269 degrees true heading, and I'm going to turn it into 279 degrees magnetic. When I get in the plane now, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to fly 27 degree, or 279 magnetic. What would I steer on the compass? So I'd reference my compass card and, and make any adjustments as appropriate. And I know what you're thinking. Hey, dude, just use a GPS. It's easier. Now, the other thing that is a, a recommended suggestion is to circle obstructions in one color and known land out sites, such as airports, in another. So maybe get a green pen and kind of circle the, the you know, good land out points that you know along the way. And then, you know, maybe use red to circle the obstructions, things like that. And it's really about 
figuring out what altitudes you need, you know, what are going to be those landmarks, what are going to be those things that you're going to see along the way. Okay. Okay. So map reading. So first, set your course directly overhead the field. You don't have to start off right away, uh, like directly off toe. you got lots of time, so sample the air, check the wind. Climb to a comfortable altitude. So we get off toe, 2,000 feet. We climb up to four, five, six, seven thousand 7,000 feet, you know, whatever that looks like. Sample the air, kind of check the wind. Now, you know, starting your course directly over the field can be problematic when you've got a control zone right ahead, right overhead. So if we're going to climb up to 6,000 feet and set up from there, well, directly over the field won't quite work. So we probably want to be a little bit displaced from there to make sure that we're not, um, you know, breaking any, any air traffic control zones. Um, pass overhead the field, set your course, compensate for any, any crosswinds, and then mark your time on the chart. So make note of your time, see what time you had it out. Uh, by doing this, you'll be able to keep track of your progress, and hence you'll be able to uh, get an idea of how fast you're going, as well as make any corrections, which we'll, we'll see in a few moments. Pick a checkpoint about 10 kilometers away. Note the time overhead or a beam the checkpoint. Mark the time on your chart. If it took you 10 minutes to get there, how long will it take to complete the task? Now, if we're doing this at 10 kilometer intervals, well, here's my first 10K. So there's, there's one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So I got five intervals till I reach Toronto Soaring. So if it took me 10 minutes to get to my first one, it's going to take me about 50 minutes to get to Toronto Soaring. Now, that's assuming I don't stop for lift. Okay. So if I have stopped for lift along the way, now let's say I got some good lift, some good height first, I set out, I did flew straight to that first 10 kilometer checkpoint, and then I started thermaling after that, well, we need to take that into account on the calculation. But if I flew halfway, five kilometers, circled, climbed, flew the other halfway, and it took me 10 minutes, then it's pretty safe to assume that the next 10 kilometers is going to be similar. Now, here's the real important question. Did you drift? Did you drift left or right of your course? If you did, you need to adjust your course to A, compensate for the drift, and B, get yourself back on course. Now, as glider pilots, um, we don't get lost. That just, that just doesn't happen. No, we, we're just momentarily disoriented. But if we do drift off track, which is common, then how do we get back on track? And there's two basic ways that we're going to take a look at this evening. The first is the double track error method, and the other is visual alteration method. I'm, I'm a big fan of the second one, visual alteration method. And this works great when you're on shorter, smaller tasks that are around known areas. So if you're you know, kind of spending most of your time tooling around your home field, you really know the, the layout of the land and the sites around and the locations and the the landmarks. Um, this becomes a really easy way to do it. Let's take a look at the double track method first. Now the basic concept here is first of all you need to do this before the midpoint because after the midpoint it doesn't quite work. So let's say you're on a course of 279 degrees magnetic. You're 12 degrees right of the course after about 15 minutes. So we've drifted to the right. Well what we need to do is do a 12 degrees course direction to the left. Now this will correct us for drift. We're now flying parallel to our course. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a 24 degree correction to the left, which means 225 or 255 degrees. And this is why we call it the double track error method. Because what we're doing is we're doubling the track error. So our track error is 12 degrees. We look on our map, we see that we're just outside of that drift line to the right. We see you know, a, a, a landmark on the ground, etc. Think, oh, we got to correct for this. If you change course 12 degrees, it'll basically put you parallel. Change course 24 degrees, it'll, it'll bring you back. Now, don't forget, once you get back on your course, to change your course 12 degrees to the right, which is 267 degrees, once you regain track. So notice what we've done is we've compensated by turning left 24 degrees. When we get back on track, we turn right 12 degrees. 
which means we've kept in the, the first 12 degrees of compensation to correct for drift. So this is what it would look like. We set out from Toronto, we're heading towards um, uh, Toronto, or sorry, we head out from Great Lakes, we're heading towards Toronto Soaring. We see that we're off to the right, you know, we see Shelburne directly ahead of us. We see uh, Burbank's a little bit off to the left. So we're going, yeah, this isn't looking right. Let's change course. So we alter the course, and here's what the resulting track is going to look like. Now, if it took us 15 minutes to get to this position, turn left, do 15 minutes, it'll bring us back in. And this is actually one of the most efficient, um, and, and um, it, it, it's a really quick and easy way to kind of get us back on track. And then we would, of course, change to change course again and, and finish out heading to to um, uh, Toronto Soaring. The other method uh, is the visual alteration method. And in visual alteration, you identify a landmark ahead, steer towards it. Once there, alter your original course. So from a heading of 270, again, we've drifted to the right 12 degrees. We would take the new heading of 279, sorry, 279 degrees, excuse me, 12 degrees to the right. We'd subtract the 12 degrees and we would be at 267 degrees. And basically, similar idea to this. Now, I might use this airfield here as my visual reference. Um, you know, you know, I use whatever visual reference I'm gonna, I can find along the way to to get myself back onto that course line. And that visual reference may be, you know, maybe up here or something. You know, whatever that looks like. The key here to this one is that you need to alter your course to compensate for the drift once you have uh, regained onto your path. Okay. Now, some mental flight calculations. And we decided to put this session together to be more of the um, non-compensated, non-electronic version of navigation because we really need to understand what's going on. And there's a lot of uh, very easy to develop and, and very useful skills around doing this kind of calculation. The first is calculating your ETA, your estimated time of arrival. Some really simple ways to do this, folks. If you're a quarter of the way to your destination, take the current elapsed time and multiply it by four. If you're halfway, double your elapsed time. You know, I mean, simple, easy calculations. This is why you want to make note of your time when you left, when you set out on course. Okay, so you've got a, a good idea of that. Um, stopwatch is a really great thing to have inside the cockpit. Now, calculating ground speed, we can do this using fractions. So if you've gone 10 kilometers in 12 minutes, well, 12 minutes is one-fifth of an hour. So you've gone 50 kilometers an hour. Uh, excuse me, if you've done 20 nautical miles in 20 minutes, well, that's a third of an hour, so it's 60 knots. Right, so you're doing, you know, you're you're cooking along at a, at a pretty good rate there, right? Sixty knots, and you know these are easy, simple calculations. Now, of course, we have electronic devices to help us, and they can, you know, give us a lot of this information. But we don't want to become too reliant on them because one day they're going to fail, and I guarantee it's when you need it the most. All right, so what do you do if you get lost? What procedure first? You get lost. First thing, very key, remain calm. Panicking's not going to help. Um, keep in mind, if you're unsure of your position, there's always plenty of landable fields around you. So, you know what? If you've got good height, scout around, see what's there. Find some good landable fields, especially if you start to get low and you're lost. You know what? Your priority now is find a good landable field and put the airplane down safely. Once you're on the ground, you'll have all kinds of time to figure out what's going on and where you are. First thing, fly straight and level and note what the compass is telling you. I mean, we, we kind of bashed the compass a little bit early in this, in this session, but the reality is it's an extremely reliable instrument. Um, it has its limitations and, and it has its considerations around use, but you level your wings and just maintain a constant speed. It doesn't take it long to settle down. And even if it's reading off by 5 or 10 degrees, you'll have a pretty good indication of which way is north, which way is south, which way is east, which way is west. 
And if you are so lost that you don't know whether you're east or west of the field, well, either you're right on top of it and, and you've just become disoriented, or um, you really probably shouldn't be flying because if you're any distance away from the airfield and you don't really know if you're north or south or east or west of the field, um, you, you got some bigger problems here. Probably best if you just land. All right, so fly straight ahead. Note what the compass is telling you. Check your previous calculations on ground speed. Okay, so we got a pretty huge scale here, one to 250,000. So it's going to take you a while to move anywhere. Um, find your last positively identified landmark. Now, as you're flying along, you should have your map out, and you should be, you know, identifying those landmarks. Okay, they're, they're Shelburne off to the right. I see that on the map. I make note of that, right? Uh, you're flying along. You're seeing, you know, Burbank Field. You're seeing, um, okay, you know, there's Highway 9 or, you know, there's Orange Hill or, you know, whatever landmarks appropriate. And, you know, identify those landmarks. Make note of them on the map. And keep a mental picture of where you are. Now, note the elapsed time since passing that landmark, okay? And you can use that to determine the distance on the map that you've traveled, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't take a lot. So, you know, if, if you haven't seen a landmark for, for a little bit, you've probably only gone maybe an inch or two on the map. Um, it actually takes a while to go, you know, that kind of distance. So, you know, we, we take a look at uh, this here. There's 50 kilometers. So if you're flying 50 kilometers an hour, it's going to take you an hour to go that distance. And that's assuming you're flying straight lines, right? So for averaging that 50 kilometers an hour. So it's going to take you a while to get there, right? So if I divide this line in half, well, there's 30 minutes. I divide it in half again. There's 15 minutes. And that's assuming I'm doing a straight line. So I've gone, what is that, Highway 50 to like the next road over. So it's going to take you you know, 10 minutes to go that distance, right? So if the last if the last positively identified landmark was 10 minutes ago, right? So we determined that's about 10 minutes. Let's say, you know, um, you're, you're right a beam Shelburne. You know you're on track you're right over the Burbank field here. Let's say this is your last positively identified landmark. Well, if it's been 10 minutes and you haven't identified another landmark, well, that's actually an issue right there. But if you were still on track, you'd be somewhere about here. So if I draw a circle around this positively identified landmark, in 10 minutes, that's about where you could go. So here's the question. Did you drastically alter course? Okay, so let's say you're flying along straight and level. You keep flying along straight and level. You're going to be somewhere kind of, you know, in this zone here. Okay, so what we've just done is we've taken a very huge map and we've turned it into a very small area to figure out where, you're, where, you, where you are. Now, let's assume for the moment that you are in this zone, looking at the map thinking, okay, well, there was the last positively identified landmark as over that airfield, head Shelburne off to the right. I'm somewhere up in this area here. So the first thing I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be looking for distinctive landmarks in kind of in that area. And one of the distinctive landmarks that I see on my map is this intersection right here. I see the road coming in straight. I see this road coming in at a fairly sharp angle. I see the little curve in the road here with another intersection here. So this whole little intersection bit is kind of distinctive. Okay. Um, I see a power line running down here. So again, we're talking about here's my last positively known point. I'm still heading kind of basically in this direction. So I'm kind of going to be in this area like this. So I'm going to look off to my left. I'm going to look for those power lines. If I'm relatively close to the power lines, it means I'm probably south of my track, right? If I'm relatively close to this intersection, I'm a little bit north of my track. And now I get myself reoriented and, you know, make the appropriate adjustments. Okay, so we have a very um, we have a um, a very you know even just looking out the window using these visuals, 
we, we have a lot of clues to help us, you know, navigate. Okay. Now, Roger has commented, and I'm just going to unmute Roger for a second, so I want to have a quick discussion around that. Uh, where are you, Roger? There you are. Roger. I was just I was just kidding. I noticed the video all up to the north. <laughs> <laughs> now, just for, for the, the and, and, and thank you for mentioning that, right? Um, just for the, the purpose of, of other folks here, what is a VOR? You're asking me? Yeah. It's a navigation aid where you can actually uh, find out what, uh, what radio you are off the uh, VOR, provided you have the equipment. Aha, yes. Now, what does VOR stand for? Because it's an acronym. Uh, Omni, I know what the V is, Omni, <laughs> I don't know, I can't remember. All right. Um, Dave Bradley's raising his hand desperately because he would like to chime in. David, talk to us. Oh, hi there. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think it's a VHF, very high frequency Omni range. Yeah. Omni directional. Yeah, so it's a very high frequency Omni range, and what it does is it transmits out a signal um, that you can read with an instrument on your plane, and it tells you what radial you're on, which tells you the line from the VOR to where you are, and you can. Use can I just add though, to be fair, yeah, a lot of hand, a lot of handheld radios have a VOR capability on them. Cool. I think you should you should give us a little lesson on how to do that. Yeah, quite handy. I've got, I've got one actually. A, the um, uh, what's that transceiver? The A E twenty two. I've got one right here. Nice. I, I should carry it in the Pawnee every time I go down to Delhi because it's really it's, the compass in there is not very good. No. So the icon, hap- yeah, the icon's got it. Beautiful. So what happens is, um, since compasses were very unreliable, they, uh, you know, they installed these radio beacons around, and I, if I'm not entirely mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. This is the VOR you're talking about, yeah? Yes. Okay. So this is a radio beacon, and instead of using what, your compass... What, say again? What's important, is that, what's important is around that uh, VOR, you'll see a compass rose that basically gives you lines, effectively, that are coming out of that central point. Mm-hmm. And using, using a VOR radio, which handhelds can do that, they'll tell you exactly which one of those radials you are passing over. Right. Further so, than that, some of them, some of the VOR equipment will actually give you the distance in the air from where you are to the central point of that uh, VOR as well. Nice. So basically, basically what Roger's describing is there's a, there's a series of lines, radio beacon lines, that come out of that, that, in, that VOR that look something like this. And what's going to happen is it will tell you which one you're crossing, so you could actually use it to judge, you know, where you are. Because if you know you're on this line, um, you see that you're crossing, you know, this one here, for example. It, uh, you know, if you're crossing this one here, then you know pretty much exactly where you are. Now, um, okay, if you yeah. are lost and you know you're on that line, well, what you do is you look on your chart along this line here and then look for those you know ground references that are going to help you figure out where you are that's assuming of course you don't have the instrument that tells you how far away from the VOR you are but you do need the instrumentation for that which typically gliders don't carry so I'm I'm just going to meet you again Roger thanks for the input so you need to have the instrumentation to do that so it's, it's kind of like you know we, we fly by compass because we have a compass in our airplanes, right? Now, a VOR is not something you can see from the ground. It's not a visual reference. It's a radio reference. So you would need to have those instruments, and, and gliders tend not to carry those. So we tend to do more of compass uh, visual navigation or, now more recently, GPS navigation. Okay. So should you get lost, remain calm, fly straight and level, look at your compass, Figure out your last positively identified landmark. Have a guess at what the distance on the map is that you've likely traveled, and then start looking around. Okay, so find that last likely, uh, that, that last positively identified landmark. Now, remember that one inch equals about seven nautical miles or 13 kilometers on your map. Okay, so at a ground speed of 50 kilometers an hour, 
by a half an hour, that's only two inches on your map. And really what you should be doing is maintaining a level of awareness for where you are, where you're headed, where you want to go, and all that kind of stuff. Draw your circle of uncertainty on the map, which is what I did earlier. Check for easily distinguished features on the map ahead, to the side, and even behind you. Because you know what? You might be looking in one direction, and meanwhile, what you're looking for is behind you. And we kind of have fun with this as instructors. We have fun with this with students because we'll point them away from the airfield and we'll ask them to locate the airfield. And you see them desperately searching around for it. And meanwhile, the airfield's behind you. <coughs> so to see it, you have to do a U-turn. So, you know, you sort of oriented yourself. You've got an idea where you are. You're looking for one of those good landmarks. You're not finding it. You're looking ahead. You're looking to the sides. How about if you do a quick U-turn for a minute and see what's... Or even just turn 90 degrees so that you can look off to your off to one side and, and see what was formerly behind you. <clears throat> okay. So if that doesn't work, fly towards distinguishable features such as a town, a distinctly shaped lake, um, you know, perpendicular crossing of a road or railway track. Then look on the map for this feature. So again, it's going to back up to the map for a second. Here's Luther Lake. Uh, directly south of Toronto Soaring. It's a fairly distinctive uh, feature. So you're flying along, you're lost, you're somewhere over about here somewhere, heading in this direction. You see this lake in front of you. You know what, let's fly towards the lake, have a bit of a closer look, then start looking on your map for, you know, where is that lake, okay? Um, again, you know, you might look out the window and see a town with kind of an interesting, different looking, you know, railway road structure, okay? So, you know, you're close to that, maybe you're over here somewhere, fly towards it, get a better look, figure out where you are on the map. Once you've realized that, hey, I'm right near Shelburne, you can pick up that heading. In fact, if you follow this road, um, you know, hey, we're RFR now, we can just follow this road, that'll pretty much take us right to Toronto, sorry. I know when we when we were doing some soaring out of out of Toronto soaring, I remember I was a little bit far afield, <coughs> and it's like to find my way home, I just followed this road, and then watched for Toronto soaring a little bit on the right. Um, yeah, so IFR isn't just for you know flying in class. Okay, so you know look for features on the map, and of course if we have a GPS, we're going to be using that as well. Um, the interesting thing with GPSs, though, is I find that people tend to be know the exact spot where they are because it tells them the exact location within 30 minute meters, but then they don't really know where they are. You know, so do we do we know kind of by just simply looking out and being aware, you know, that we're kind of you know this distance, we're east, west, north of the field, that kind of thing. So even with a GPS, you want to create, you know, build that awareness of where you are. As a last resort, you can always call for help. Okay, uh, we actually had an incident reported by one of the clubs last year. A uh, solo student got disoriented, got kind of a little bit lost, called down to the ground, got reoriented, made it made it home safely. <clears throat> so you know, don't be afraid to do that. So, last resort, you can always call for help. I'm lost. All right, sorry, I had to add a little humor in there. All right, so I'm going to uh, unmute everyone. Welcome back. Oh, good. Well, uh oh, I have to go on where I'm muted now. <laughs> Hi, Karen. We can hear you. Class. See, I'm on. I'm on the... <laughs> All right. I, I think Karen's trying to double double task here, multitask. So um, that's the end of our bit on navigation, and I know it was kind of a little bit more high level um, when we get out to the field and go do some flying uh, at some point this summer. Let's pull out the maps, let's plot a, a, a little route and, and go fly it. Okay, and do some practice on that. Um, my so how's, the field, how's the field looking? Uh, the, the field's looking great. We've been flying the last two weekends. Yeah? Yeah, so it's, um, I was out uh, not this past weekend, but the weekend before and did my check flights. Um, the wings are, are flying beautifully. Thank everyone for their, their hard work over the winter and, and getting them all nice and done. Um, the Pawnee is looking really nice with its its new fabric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're in, we're in good shape. 
-hmm. Yeah, so I'll be out probably Sunday. If uh, anyone wants to come on out, that would be great. I don't know what Saturday weather looks like, but uh, I'm flying home late Friday night from Boston, so I will not be safe Saturday. I'll be mm -hmm. sleeping. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Any other comments, thoughts, questions before we sign off for tonight? Uh, quiz? Yeah. Oh, the quiz. Yes, I will put that together and email it out. Um, I got called away on business. I'm, I'm, I wasn't supposed to be, but I'm down in Boston for the week. So uh, I haven't had a chance to pull that together yet. So I will do that uh, tomorrow and get it up to you and I'll email it out. I'm also, speaking of that, thank you, I'm also going to be emailing out a uh, decision-making um, self-assessment that I would like everyone to please do before next session, okay? okay. Um, it's, it's one of these ones where you got to, I'll give you a situation and then you have a bunch of choices and you rate your choices, which is your most likely through your least likely. You're not going to like them. Um, you're you're going to read them and go, I wouldn't do any of these, but I need you to make those choices for me. Okay? And it's a self-assessment, so you'll you'll be basically rating yourself. Okay? Just one comment. One yes. Question. Worth knowing or telling everyone who they should call if they are lost uh, to get the QDM service or to get the... Uh, um, are, are you offering an answer for that question? No, uh, sort of. I, I've forgotten now, but it's uh, it's in uh, when you when you look up the um, services offered by flight service stations in uh, from the ground up in the mm -hmm. radio section in the communication section. Now that would also probably necessitate having a transponder. I'm thinking. Uh, I think I'll, they can try. I think they can triangulate your transmission if you haven't got a transponder. Okay. Um, I think so. I think they can still do that by using different receivers. Yeah. So um, keep, if you transmit and you actually, yeah. Yeah. So so keeping in mind, of course, that works really well for a power plane who has an engine and can maintain altitude and pretty much hang out for an hour or so. You know, assuming fuel. Right. Yeah. So when you're in the glider, and especially if you don't have a lot of altitude, um, keep it's not going to help your, anyway. If you're going to land. Yeah. Exactly. So keep in mind your number one priority: always, always, always fly the plane. Maybe. Right. Yeah. Navigate is the second priority, and then communicate is your last. So if you do get desperately lost, um, if you're lost and you know you're pretty close to the field, maybe you're a, a you know a, a low time solo student or something like that, and, and you're just trying to you know try to kind of make it home kind of thing, it might help to call. But if you've kind of got out on a cross country and you're you know 100 kilometers from home, and especially if you're getting low, you know what? Pick a field, put it down safely. Once you're on the ground, you can pull out your phone and make phone calls and walk to the street and flag down a passing motorist and figure out where you are. I'm just curious, when you said that there was an incident, um, it's strange, first of all, it's referred to as an incident, but then uh, how did they help that person? Um, from what I understand, the student called down to the ground. Um, other people were aware of his location and sort of gave him, you know, a head east, you'll see the field in front of you kind of thing, I think is kind of what happened. So they could see him from the ground? I'm I'm not 100 percent sure if they could see him from the ground or if it was another glider in the air. But well, they basically it, it wasn't him because it wasn't him because they got lost. <laughs> no, it it wasn't it wasn't at our field. Um, this was from one of the other fields. It was from one of the the reports that came in from across the country this year. Now, do you ever do flight plans at all with a uh, long, like a very long cross country? Um, by law, you have to file a flight itinerary. Yeah, that's 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 right. not that's not the filing. You just have to notify somebody. Yeah, that you, you have are to here. notify someone. Now, gliders don't do flight plans because we we're not as predictable as power planes. Okay. Right. So if you look at a flight plan, and you know you've got things like if you're ten minutes overdue or half an hour overdue, you start notifications and things like that. I mean, you you can be much more predictable in a power plane because we've got the engine and the fuel. 
that we don't in a glider. So no, we don't we don't ever fly file flight plans. Okay. Yeah, so we do the flight notification. So basically when you start doing your cross country work, um, let people on the ground know what you're gonna do, give them an idea of where you're gonna go or at least how long you're gonna go for. And take a charged cell phone with you so that when you do land out you can phone us. Yeah, even in a flight notification, you're supposed to have, if I don't call by two hours or whatever it is, yeah. that they're supposed to contact search and rescue. Yeah, and and we do that on the field. Um, it's a little bit more informally. You know, we, we know when people are going off cross-country and expect them back in several hours. And so, you know, we keep an eye out and watch for people at the end of the day. Good. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night, all. I will be emailing out the um, the uh, the quiz, and we'll see you all next week.